Hey history buffs, it's Nick Hodges here. Unfortunately, there's going to be a bit of a delay with my next review for Elizabeth the Golden Age. But don't worry, the script is nearly finished. So, in the meantime, I thought I'd release some of my favourite interviews that I did when I was working on History's Vikings podcast. In this video that my team put together, I talked to the cast of the show during their Season 4 run. And the next video that I should be releasing shortly afterwards will be with Michael Hurst and the crew. For those of you who are Vikings fans, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, my name is Alexander Ludwig, Ludwig and I play uh, Bjorn. No, I'm just kidding. I'm Gustav Skarsgård. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gustav Skarsgård and I play Floki in Vikings. I'm Alexander Ludwig, the real one, and I play Bjorn <laughs> in Vikings. Okay, uh, so you guys have been working together for a few years now and have spent a lot of time together on set. So what's that been like? It's family. It really is. We've been through so much together over such a long period of time. And also because we're away from home, you know, we're, we're here stuck in the muck of Wicklow Mountains. So all we have is each other. And there are no divas because there's no room for that, you know, when, when you're in the mud. So we're really like family. I mean, Alexander's like a brother to me. Yeah, Gustav and I, I mean, that's the only way to describe it. It's, it's so much closer than just friends. It's closer to lovers. <laughs> 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 and uh, you shouldn't reveal that. Uh, sorry, honey. So, Gustav, you're actually one of the few Scandinavians on the set as part of the crew. Mm. And coming from that, what's been your impression on how Vikings has handled your people's history? Well, I think I've kind of, even from the start, I kind of have a Scandinavian veto, you know, on the show. If there's something, I, you know, I come across in, in the script that I feel like that's a bit, you know, uh, Michael is always open for, for those kind of comments. He's always, you know, encouraging of that. But uh, there are still things, you know, slipping through the net. Do you want to share what uh, slips through? I mean, apart from the, the timeline, that's very off, you know, in terms of like, because we just, you know, we want to tell these amazing stories and we just have to compromise on, on the accuracy of, of that and, and the timeline. Yeah, it's more the geography. Like, I don't really know where this Kattegat is. Kattegat yeah. is uh, the name of a sea not a place, and uh, they mm -hmm. refer to Sweden, uh, even though there was no Sweden at this time. If Kattegat is not Sweden, not Denmark, and not Norway, then what is it? You know, so it's a bit confusing, and also like shooting the stuff in Uppsala, and everybody who's been to Uppsala knows that it's very flat, and when you come there in, in the series, it's like the fjords of Uppsala, there are <laughs> no such things. Yeah. So that all that is, is kind of, yeah, not very accurate. No. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's okay, it's doable. When Bjorn uh, spares Rolo, is it because he still loves him or still needs him? Uh, it's, uh, it's a little of both, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's uh, political, absolutely, because yeah. you know he's Bjorn has become a very smart leader, mm. um, and he's leading with his head, not with his heart. Um, so he won't make emotional decisions. He sits back and. You know, he doesn't let his emotions uh, control the outcome of a situation. Uh, and with Rolo, he wants nothing more than to, at that moment, kill him. Yeah. Um, for everything he's done, you know, because it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's like history has consistently repeated itself yeah. with Rolo and... Yeah, so he's thinking that uh, he has to watch his back when he returns to the Frankish coast at some point. Yeah, and I don't know exactly what you saw. Did you see, like, when he gets like, thrown overboard? He's thrown overboard and he's, like, uh, back is against the, the keel of the boat? Yeah, so that's a that's a form of torture that the Vikings used. Yeah. And I, and I thought, thought that it was imperative that we showed that because I said, there's no way we would let Rolo get away with all that without doing anything. Exactly. So I think that there is a, a form of dominance he has to... Um, he has to establish, um, yeah. and he does. And so he's, you know, he's like, at any moment, I could kill you. I'm deciding to keep you alive. Yeah, I mean, like, was he uh, debating about giving the order to sail? Because would that uh, break Rollo's back? Uh, is that how the, the torture would work? Yeah. Well, no. What would happen is, uh, no. The uh, what would happen was, so they throw the person overboard, and they'd actually drag them underneath the boat. And the barnacles from the yeah. that are attached to the bottom of the boat would rip his back Ooh. open, um, and the moment that you're talking about is a moment of whether or not to continue pulling him up the yeah. other side or to leave him there to die. Yeah. Um, and there's a moment where Bjorn has to control his own emotion and and go, no, it's smarter to bring him back up, even though you know, because he's still he, he's a Duke of Normandy. It's uh, you know, they control a, a part of the of the sea uh, uh, that's imperative for. For, yeah. for them, because that, that's as far as their known world really goes. 
How do you read Rollo's journey in the season? I think it all started when Rollo goes to see the seer. That's when he um, he makes this decision. Um, in season three, he sits down with the seer, and he's he's at the the point of suicide. He's got nothing left. Um, Siggy's mm -hmm. left him. He feels ugly and betrayed yeah. in the inside by Ragnar, and there is no reason for him to stay in Kattegat anymore. If he hadn't have gone to the seer and hadn't heard the words that came out of the seer's mouth, which is, if you only knew Rollo, you'd be dancing naked on the yeah. sand, <laughs> he, he would have ended his life. I think that moment at the end of season three where Bjorn asks for someone to stay and Rollo you know, almost raises his hand and, and gives, makes it no question that he's the one that's going to stay, it's because there's nothing left for him in Kattegat anymore. And he's holding on to just this, these words that the seer said. And he has no idea what's going to happen, but he just knows that yeah. his fate doesn't lie with Ragnar anymore. I don't think he realizes that it's necessarily going to mean that he has to betray his brother and fight his brother again. It's more about just he has to find some kind of destiny and some kind of worth in Paris. And by God, it's an uphill struggle from the first episode. He's come into Paris. He's had to marry a princess who would rather vomit than go anywhere near him. <laughs> and, and, and he forgets that, that all the people of Paris, the last time they saw him, you know, he was raiding and, and berserking the streets of Paris as the, the crazy bear. But I think knowing what he's given up from the Vikings, he has he has to make this work. He can't just go back to Ragnar with his tail between his legs like he did the first time. He has to learn some sort of etiquette to survive in the French court. And he has to make alliances with the king. And what's very complicated about the French court is that they're far more backstabbing, they're far more Machiavellian than the Vikings. Absolutely. And he's just loyal to the end as the way he's been brought up as a Viking. He won't stab people in the back. He holds his heart on his sleeve when it comes to, to King Charles. And I think what's interesting is the fans and, and the viewer, it kind of almost expects at the last minute for there to be some kind of plan that involves Ragnar and Rollo, that Rollo's going to, at the last minute, open the back door to Paris and let Ragnar in. But no, he's a far more cerebral Rollo. He's, he's a thinker. He's yeah. thought his plan through. No one knows Ragnar better than, than Rollo. And he, I think he second guesses him at every opportunity. He's outplanned him. He's outmaneuvered yeah. him. He's outfought him. And this is, this, is, this is the beginning of the Rollo that we know from history. And this is all that anyone really knows. And there's lots of uh, artifacts and historical writing on Rollo from that point onwards, but no one really knows the Rollo of old, the Viking Rollo. So it was more about investing in, in being a pagan and, and the Viking ways at the beginning of the journey. But mm. we decided we were just gonna get the character Rollo in our hand and just smash him on the floor into a thousand pieces <laughs> and then use season one to season four to piece him back together to eventually come to the point of, of the Rollo that people know from history. Rather than the prince to a pauper, it's almost been a pauper to a prince. It's been an interesting discovery to start him off with such a base pagan Neanderthal almost and to create this Duke of Normandy, the man in history who's responsible for the lineage of, of William the Conqueror. He's Absolutely. the great, 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 great grandfather of William the Conqueror, yeah. the very first Norman. And um, when I went and uh, researched him in Rouen, there's lots of Viking swords and artifacts that have been dredged from the River Seine, and they can tell that they had uh, winter camps all along the, the Seine. So he wasn't obviously the only one. So we, we, we created this Viking camp that Rollo was in charge of until Ragnar came back, and then, and then Rollo decimates them all. But you know, like I said, nobody really knows what happened in history, and if you carry on with season four, you'll realize that Rollo makes a certain speech that insinuates what is to come when it concerns the ah, Normans. Okay. So Michael had his plan, and it, he just had a little different spin than I had on it. I want to make you all an offer. Anyone from our homelands who wants good, rich lands to farm can come and live in my kingdom. will always be a part of Frankia, which is a part of us. From the very beginning, there was one Swedish proverb which abbreviated into English. It basically means that everyone wants to be loved, and if they can't be loved, they'll be admired, and if they can't find admiration, then they'll be feared. And if they can't be feared, then they'll move to being hated. Everyone just wants to fit in. They want to be recognized for something, and that's kind of the journey I said Rollo was going on, and this is where he is now. He's tried to be loved. He's tried to be admired. Whether he tried to be loved with, by Lagatha, whether he tried to be admired by his father and his brother, mm. and he wanted to be feared, which is what he kind of created in Kattegat as this ruthless warrior 
and that didn't work either. So now he's prepared to be hated by a certain amount of people in order to find love and fame with a different society of people. Hail Caesar! take this the wrong way, but I don't exactly trust every single thing that comes out of his mouth. I think that's a very wise decision. Yeah. Michael once said to me, there's a whole period in the show where everything Egbert said was a lie mm -hmm. and also true. How does like that work? Both at the same time. It's like he was, because he could look at you and, mm. and say something and almost everything had a double meaning. And that's a lot of fun to play. You can see there's a man who's got a lot of scope. Yeah. He's got a lot of vision and he's a different kind of leader and thinker. He's a politician. He's not just a warrior king. And I think that gave this room to go a long way with this character in terms of what's he willing to do in order to get what he wants. There's a great bit in episode five when um, King Eckbert is in the church and he's giving a confession to God. And this is when he's locked all the doors and he's completely alone. sinner and I think you have already decided to cast me out into the darkness like a fallen angel to suffer in purgatory or the fires of hell for all eternity am I not a man like other men and yet I would sup with the devil if he would show me how to achieve my earthly goals. Your kingdom, Lord, as you have said, is not of this world, but my kingdom is. Do you think that's the only time he's been 100% honest in that scene? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to hear your response maybe we'll get to talk again later in, yeah. in the year but you know the journey of season four for me is an incredible journey of taking this character kind of as far as I possibly can imagine taking him and I think it's wonderful that at that point here's a man who's got a very big clear vision and has very few scruples about what he has to do to succeed He's free to right. do what he wants. He can do the most horrendous things and somehow be unscathed, untouched, and it's all in the name of his one aim and goal. But I think there comes a point where there's a line that gets crossed. And it's like once you've crossed that line, you kind of know, now I'm not actually going to get away with this. There's going to be damage to my soul. I've betrayed so many people. I've been so unjust that you can't just be free and have no conscience about it. And I think he, he crosses this line and then gets to this point where he knows that if he was to be this God-fearing person and take Athelstan's example, and yeah. be a man, then he would never be able to do what he's going to do. So he actually turns to God and is totally honest, like you said. For me, that's one of the moments that stand out the most mm. with Egbert. Like, did you like, prepare a lot for that scene? <sighs> a lot. I can't tell you how much preparation went into that. <laughs> but then it was myself and Helen Shaver, the director, because she wanted to understand how to do it, how to shoot it, how to act it. And, and we talked, I can't tell you how many hours, just understanding, you know, is that out loud? How interior is it? You know, what's his emotional state within it? How does he walk? You know what I mean? So there was a lot of preparation and talk. And in the end, this was a moment where this man is going enough. Mm. I have to take my stand. This is my choice. This is my life. And if it means going to hell, so be it. Well, that's why he's such an interesting character. I think so, too. I mean, I've loved every minute of playing this part. I have to say it's been extraordinary. He's also quite a funny character as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's, yeah. There's a, a bit, I can't remember a bit, sometime in season four when uh, Queen Quentrith approaches you and she goes... <laughs> I need to know that I can trust you, that you will do what you promised me. 
Why would you doubt me? You've heard me speak plainly and in public. I doubt you for one reason only, and that is that you and I are somewhat alike. Then do not judge yourself too harshly. <laughs> it's great. No, no, it's, he's very witty. <laughs> and he's very ironic and self-aware. And, you know, there's very few people he can really relate to because there aren't any equals. Mm. That's why he's so drawn to Ragnar. And it's almost like just drawn towards the brilliance of the man. Because I think, I think Ragnar possesses a quality that Egbert doesn't quite have, which is more of an intuitive leadership and two great minds and slightly different approaches but of the same ilk. You realize you've got two extraordinary thinkers, you know, very different backgrounds, but they have the same spark of genius, if you like, and, and they recognize that in each other. Well, yeah, well, he is definitely the smartest character in, yeah. in Wessex, it feels like. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems in most of England at that point. Yeah, I mean, exactly, yeah. Well, he outwits everybody. Do you think you're a good man? Yes, I think so. Are you a good man? Yes. I think so. Are you corrupt? Oh, yes. Are you? Mm -hmm. we, we have a lot together throughout season four, and that relationship goes on quite an interesting journey. But I mean, his relationship with his son is also like awful. I mean, it makes me wonder if he really is his son because there's nothing like his dad at all. Nothing like his dad. And I mean, one of the first things he does with his son is send him out as a hostage. And then he's constantly sending him out to battle, knowing that he might never come back. You know, he's willing to sacrifice him. And yet he, he trusts him as a general and a warrior, but he's so kind of dismissive and even abusive of who Wolf is. And yet in this season, we're finding a place where we actually find some... Common ground? Yeah, well, some understanding. There's some closure that we're managing to, to find, which was amazing to try and track that journey. And Mo's an amazing actor. So it's been a joy to sort of plot all that with him and then find these because there was a certain point where I just turned to Mo and I said I don't think there's ever going to be another scene where I can abuse you again we can't do that anymore yeah. there's, we've reached a point where you have to confront me and Michael wrote that and, and I hope this scene comes out well but in uh, the latter part of season four it's a very powerful scene I guess my first question is, what can we expect in season four for Aetherwolf himself? Uh, we appear in episode two, Kill the Queen, and Aetherwolf is kind of on equal footing with his dad and is really trying to earn the right of being a prince or a commander to the soldiers. And there's this fantastic battle where he's sent out to Mercia. There's a queen at the top of the tower. He has to get there. And without any dialogue, without any lines, I think it shows more about the character and that you've ever seen about the character of how far he's willing to go, how unrelenting he can be, and how brave the character is, really. So it's amazing what Michael had wrote, what you can show about a character through action scenes, that it means something. It's not just you're cutting through waves and waves of soldiers like a knife through butter. You know, it means something. <laughs> You can expect to see him as a, as a commander, as a guy who leads armies. You can expect to see a couple of times of Egbert sending him out there, probably expecting him to die and not come back. <laughs> you can expect to see him go further afield. He travels to Rome with young Alfred, and Alfred is beginning to really become a big player in this show. Aethelwulf has taken him under his wing, and. I suppose for half the first season, anyway, you're not too sure how he feels about that. You, you, you will find out eventually. A lot more things are happening and developing within the mind and the character of Aether Wolf now, at the end of season three and throughout season four. He's making up his own mind about things and he's a good commander. I think that's really important in the show that 
the side of the English aren't just these grunts that get killed. You see that there's a lot of brave soldiers go out there and they're smart and they have tactics and we can see that the Vikings are going to have a, a hard battle against the, the English when they do come over. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you don't mind, uh, I just want to go back a little bit. So do you think this relationship developing with Quentrith is changing him? Because uh, like the way I see it, before this, his character was defined by his relationship with other characters like Judith and uh, especially his father, uh, Eckbert. Yeah, de definitely. I think that there's someone else there for Aethel Wolf to be with in those episodes. He becomes more aware of what his father is like. He finds out about Judith and uh, his father. I think it hurts him deep down that he's been such a fool for so long, you know. Right. He's not cut from the same block as Eckbert is, but... Um, one day down the line, he'll become a, a powerful king, so he believes, you know. Yeah, like uh, one of the things I notice in Vikings are the father and son relationships, whether it be with the Vikings or the Saxons. Uh, like, it does seem to be one of the major themes in Vikings, right? That's a good question. Uh, at its heart, the main thing I love about Vikings is Vikings is a show essentially about fathers and sons and about lineage and about legacy. Linus has just been incredible as Eckbert, you know, he's so dynamic and you don't really know which way he's thinking but you like the guy because he's so damn <laughs> smart and funny <laughs> but me and Linus have become really good buddies I've learned a lot from him. Do you think Ivar's actions uh, reflect on Floki's teachings? I think they do to a point and then I think he actually goes takes it even further in terms of craziness and, and darkness and I think when 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 Floki's left, when Floki leaves him, I think he's like, you'll be fine. I'm, prou <laughs> I'm proud of you. You'll, you know, keep yeah. doing your thing. But but if he was to stay around for longer, I'm not sure he would, you know, yeah. concur of his actions anymore. Because yeah, there's one moment that um, when Ivar was a little boy and he killed the other kid with the axe, yeah. like that must have just jarred Floki a little bit. It did. It, it did, because then he saw what he was capable of. Yeah. You know, he saw what this kid was capable of, and he was mm. baffled and amazed and scared, I think, all yeah. at once. Because I was kind of wondering if it's like that subplot is turning to almost like a Frankenstein sort of, you know, monster. Like, what have I created? You know, that's Well, of if Floki wouldn't have been busy, it might have. But, <laughs> but he's not around for that. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, here's a fun one. How is it for Floki to hammer in the nails into King Ayla's hands during the, the Blood Eagle? It was lovely. Yeah. I think he certainly enjoyed that. Yeah. Especially his punchline before that. Yeah. Yeah, what was it? I've been told your god was a carpenter. And guess what? So am I. <laughs> Cut to nails in hand. <laughs> I've been told your god is a carpenter. And guess what? So am I. Other little piggies will crap. When they hear earth hill. It gladdens me to know that Odin prepares for a feast. This hero that comes into Valhalla does not lament his death. I shall not enter Odin's hall with fear. There, I shall wait for my sons to join. And when they do, I will bask in their tales of triumph. The Aesir will welcome me. My death comes without apology. And I welcome the Valkyries to summon me home!